We have a handful of cases. We'll see how many we get through. We have, uh, um, I will tell you uh, uh, at the moment, uh, at the end, uh, we have uh, Abrar Qureshi, uh, who is a noted uh, dermatologist, head of the uh, dermatology unit at Brown, uh, has made major contributions in, in the field of uh, immunodermatology, and so that suggests that we might have some skin things going on here. I don't know. I'm just going out on a limb, okay? Uh, next to him, I have Doug Jabs. Doug Jabs is uh, the chief of ophthalmology at Mount Sinai uh, in New York City. Uh, Doug is a very special guy because he is not only a, uh, an accomplished and, and recognized ophthalmologist uh, in the field, but he's also a fully trained rheumatologist. So uh, he, is a, he is a double threat here. So, um, uh, uh, and then we have a couple people off in the uh, Ethernet somewhere. We might be calling them. We'll see what go, goes on here. So uh, here's the ground rule. So A, I haven't shown any of these guys the cases. So this is, this is cold material for them. Uh, B, these are all uh, cases that, that we have dealt with in some way, shape, or form. A few liberties taken here. At the other end of the table is uh, Elaine Husney. Um, who is my associate at the Cleveland Clinic, runs the, the uh, uh, arth uh, multidisciplinary arthritis clinic, is a known researcher in cardiovascular disease and, and psoriasis, and is my, uh, my, essentially my right arm in, at, uh, at back home uh, at main campus. Um, and so she's go going to be adding to the mix. So here's the rules, guys. So these are cases. And uh, yeah, they're going to deal with different diseases, but just because you talked about rheumatoid or spondy or you talked about psoriasis doesn't mean you're limited to this. You're all clinicians and you don't screen people. At least I hope you don't. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're so important you screen people now. Like at the Cleveland Clinic, we still yeah. see everybody that has everything. We walk in the door, they have fibro, I still see them. So uh, everybody gets to talk about everything. Um, uh, and uh, that's how we're going to start. So, let's start with the first case. And uh, so, this is uh, Michael. And he is a 39-year-old auto worker from Cleveland, and there are a lot of auto workers in Cleveland. He has uh, been a very healthy guy. Uh, but in the past three to four months, as he initially states, and it's probably more like six to eight months, he has developed uh, uh, pain in his joints that now is uh, impairing him and uh, threatening his work on the assembly line. He uh, psychosocially is the sole breadwinner of his family. So he has a primary care physician who did a, some tests on him and said, hey, uh, Michael, you know, you probably have rheumatoid. And uh, try this naproxen and uh, uh, take this Medrol dose pack. And uh, he took a uh, Medrol dose pack and he uh, actually said it felt pretty remarkable, uh, but inevitably it wore off and he took another one and uh, had kind of a similar response. And he relates at the time of this clinic evaluation that he is fearful. He is, he is fearful that he may not be able to meet the demands of his job. It's not, you know, like you know, working with a sledgehammer, but he works with his hands and this is assembly line work and there's really not much going on. His family history is really fairly non-contributory here, as I, as I point out. His father died of a stroke in the 70s. Um, he smokes a half pack a day, and you know he's, he says, you know, I'd, I'd like to quit this. I've tried this like 20 times, and I, it's not working. And uh, yeah, after work, I, uh, I have a few beers, and that, uh, that's a big part of my life, actually. And I meet with these guys, and that's, that's what his stated notion is. So he has no other medications, and he has really no other chronic medical problems. So you know, uh, in initial intake shows you know he's he's slightly anemic. Um, his metabolic profile shows a, an ALT of 44. You can read into that what you want to. Um, he's seropositive for rheumatoid factor and strongly seropositive for ACPA. He has elevated acute phase reactants in terms of CRP and sed rate. HAC is actually 1.4 at this juncture. 
uh, after hmm. going through this several times with him. And he has uh, a bunch of uh, swollen and uh, tender joints uh, and states quite honestly has a lot of pain. And his DAS at the present time is 6.47. So, okay, first blush, this man is uh, in the clinic here. You're hearing his story. He's got, he's got a story on top of a disease. Um, you know, what, uh, what, what, what is the pro forma? I mean, without putting him into a study right now, uh, what, what's, what's gonna happen here, guys? What, 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 do you, what do you wanna do before you take on this guy who is desperate uh, to control this diathesis? Okay, this isn't exactly the way I pictured this. <laughs> you know, I, I know they just need a little warming up for her, right? I'm, I'm looking for what the pitfall is here. Yeah. <laughs> this guy is got, needs the best therapy there is. I mean, presumably he has an x-ray and, uh, you know, he's got high... He has, baseline, he has baseline erosions. All right, so I don't, I don't oh, want to make no. more of it than what it is. He's, he's, uh, well, those are pretty atypical erosions. Well, just just roll with me on this. He's 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 got he's got baseline erosions, like even for, for a slight disease. <laughs> just just humor me with this. The well, point uh, th this he, is yeah. Uh, I I don't think that anybody in the room here. This is not a mystery here. This guy has rheumatoid arthritis. He's got serious rheumatoid arthritis. Now, Paul, I know your your passion here as you uh, finished out your talk. Uh, probably where you're going to go. Uh, but here's this guy, so I mean, um, uh, he has given you his goals, uh, and I'm not talking to Paul particularly. Uh, so how do you engage this guy, and, and uh, where, where do you go? Uh, are we, uh, we're, we're starting with, our, with the U.S. Well, guidelines, the new guidelines, the old guidelines, or where, where, do, we, where do we go? We assume you've done your eight, and there's, you've excluded other... He, is not, he has rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. All right. But that... <laughs> I can't remember seeing PIPs like that in a newly presenting case for years. They so. miss a lot of diagnosis at the Cleveland Clinic. That's a you good know, that's, uh, I yeah. just told you, just roll with me on this. He has rheumatoid arthritis, okay? All right. Okay, he's got rheumatoid arthritis. He needs the best therapy that you've got under your jurisdiction. So the I don't know what... The best therapy that we have under our jurisdiction. So he would get, according to our guidelines, he would probably get steroids and he probably... He's got high DAS, he's, got, he's doubly positive, he's got the worst prognostic factors, he's got every factor that predicts a poor response to methotrexate or a rapid progression on x-ray with methotrexate. You're going, we, what we would do is actually give him some steroids to suppress his acute phase response, give him two methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine purely so he can have failed two DMARDs and therefore be eligible for biologics is at three months. Is that the uh, kabuki dance that you have to do yep. for uh, biologics? Correct, yes. So, mm -hmm. and he would then, we would keep him on steroid artificially well and then reduce his steroid at three months where he would flare and then he'd get an anti-TNF. Okay. Uh, but he says, uh, right. I'm not going to stop drinking, Doc. Yeah, okay. I don't yeah. care. So, I mean, there's, there is an He's issue here. Life. I mean, do you think yeah. an ALT of 44 is just fine? Yeah, or? yeah. All right. All right. And, he said he's and, not going to stop drinking, and he might have hepatitis. I mean, are you going to give him methotrexate or what? He would get hepat He'd get screened. Uh, they all do before methotrexate, yeah. But so he doesn't, he, he's so a, it is in the Cleveland C Clinic. Negative. They might not screen him, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. They're yeah. Right. And uh, so, uh, in a guy that, uh, he, uh, that uh, uh, oh, well, first of all, I, I, I want to, Philip, you want to say anything at this juncture? Thus far, I, although you've emphasized quite a bit his anxiety, so he's not that macho a guy that he doesn't communicate that. He's going to be anxious about methotrexate because he doesn't want to give up his social engagement and cut down on the beer. I think thing. that's correct, actually. Uh, and so, in, in our setting, and we are not, we're not in the UK, we would get, uh, get him to anti-TNF therapy pretty rapidly. We might put a little show screen of a um, little bit of methotrexate and explain to him we've got to do this just for uh, appearances sake, but would, we'd, I think we'd get him to anti-TNF therapy. Really. All right, let's say he tells you that his co-payment for anti-TNF therapy is 500 a month and he can't afford it. So what would you do? We'd, um, we have a squadron of people in the office that would put him in touch with the foundation for the various companies and uh, 
oftentimes they can do some magic in relation to that, getting, getting, getting access to uh, anti-Tina. Besides, the UCB rep has just left a whole slew of samples of uh, <laughs> uh, Sertalismab in the office. Yeah, I saw <laughs> that. We were not allowed to do that. To clear the glass, so, but I, I'm, I actually, I sent them to you for that. That's very good. So, when would you try and do something about a cigarette smoking? Oh, okay, so, uh, there's, a, there's a mystery voice here on, uh, on that point. So let's, uh, let's, bring, uh, let's bring in, um, uh, this is Dr. Michael. Okay, not only is it Dr. Michael Roizen, but by the head bobbing, I suspect <laughs> that he is in his office on his, uh, uh, on his desk treadmill. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, what's your speed? <laughs> um, 1.7. Okay, I hear, that, I hear you can uh, telecon at 1.7, but uh, you can't uh, write very well. Is that right? Is something like that? No, no, I, I write at 1.7. I can type at 1.8, uh, and I can do telecom at 3.3, 3, but I didn't want to bob that much. Okay, so uh, this is Dr. Michael Roizen. He is head of the Wellness Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. So, Michael, we thought you were, what's happening, you were trying to jump through the screen and strangle <laughs> us because we weren't getting him to cease his smoking more rapidly. No, no, no. so I, I, let me finish my introduction. So, uh, Dr. Roizen probably needs no introduction uh, to anyone. He is a uh, New York Times a multiple best selling author. Uh, in multiple domains of uh, living long, living well, living healthy. So he actually brings up a point that we actually all blew by here. So we're, we're focused on his uh, beer drinking, um, uh, but this is an uh, auto worker smoking guy. So uh, what, what's the good news and the bad news uh, from the smoking here? He's what, what pro act, what, uh, uh, Paul, you're, you're, you come from an uh, industrial town. You must yep. have a couple people that smoke cigarettes, I suspect. Yep. Um, the Do good, you the good, the, the time. Do you broach this, or is it a kind you, of pro No, well, the, the time uh, when we, it is good news to be a smoker is when we're in our ACPA, our CCP clinic, where if they're not shared epitope and they're a smoker, they're not going to progress. But this guy who's already got multiple erosions, smoking will influence uh, his response to TNF more than anything. That's probably the biggest influence. There's not much evidence you'll change the pathogenesis at this point. How aggressive are any of you, any of you, and, and this, uh, Elaine, I'm going to ask her to throw into this because we're trying to adjust our own systems to uh, 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 <coughs> approach some of these wellness issues. So, smoker in the rheumatology clinic, uh, what do you do, Michael? You just say, like, hey, that's not a good idea? Uh, do you have some formal algorithmic approach to this? Are you just being a good doctor or what? Well, I sit down with a patient and I explain, I go through all the data about cigarette smoking susceptibility and severity of rheumatoid arthritis, in addition to everything else it's going to cause. Uh, and, uh, and I do all that and it never works. <laughs> okay, and, and so I have to live with it. And the same thing with the drinking. Uh, so it's just, it's just not going to work. Sometimes. So this is your own personal therapy. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know. Philip? I have to acknowledge that Michael is correct here, that we often will do what we can to preach about this. But it's going to come uh, from, well, for one thing, I would get his wife in the clinic. Uh, and make sure she was there listening to this conversation because even though he may be a macho guy with her that and says put, and pushes her away, he's now feeling vulnerable. Uh, and uh, I think that he, there's going to be uh, the family system is going to come into play here. And I really appreciate Michael's bringing this to our attention. And I'm dying to know what Michael would do in this. Well, setting. I want to get Elaine on this because she's our cardiovascular person that's highly invested in this. Elaine? All right. So this guy has no other chronic problems, right? So you know now, you've just told him that he has a disease that you can't cure. So I'm not sure he's listening to anything about drinking or smoking at this point. So you have time. I mean, I, I would say at this point, he's coming to you as a specialist. He's, he's deathly afraid. You just told him he has a lifelong disease that you can't cure. I would probably, you know, really talk about therapy, try to stop, uh, you know, try to put him on something. Um, I think the smoking issue is really important. I don't think this is the time to do it in the first, in the first visit. Um, I, I do, 
I do sometimes have a heart to heart and say, you know, about drinking to say, hey, you know, just try this, you know, especially if people in the UK have to jump through some dances that, um, you know, maybe addressing some of the drinking to see if um, they could really, you know, stop for a little bit and give you a trial, even though you might not think it works and you want to go on to TNF. Okay. Hey, Michael, uh, so uh, in terms of uh, formal interventions, what are the data? What would what, what you offer this guy? Um, the, uh, if you go cold turkey, which is what you've got to do is find out what he's tried before. My guess is if you said he's an auto worker and hasn't done, tried 20 or 30 times before he's tried to go cold turkey, success rate of cold turkey is about 2%. You propion, nicotine, and a buddy, plus trying to get him to walk, all good things for um, RA, if you will, at least won't harm him, gets you up to about a 30% success rate. So to, tr to say he won't succeed because I'm giving him a lecture is to use the wrong approach. Lectures never work. So what you have to do is say, look, this is very difficult. And this is what we're going to try. We're going to have you start walking. We're going to have you have a buddy, whether it's your wife or someone else in the clinic or a nurse, that you're going to give your steps to and your food to as we change your food as well to decrease the pain of the arthritis. But without going to, to try and do this, we're just, we're, you know, smoking is a major component of arthritic pain. And if this is the way we're going to try and do this, and we're going to do it all at the same time, you've got an ideal time to motivate him because he's emotionally involved. And so you, use, you put a patch on. It's 14 milligrams for two-thirds of a pack. I think you said he was a half to two-thirds of a pack. So 14 milligrams patch and uh, 150 milligrams of bupropion BID, and then you wean it over a six-month period. Okay, well, I mean, there's some, there are some options, and it's great to have some proactive involvement. So let me get back to now the therapy. Okay, so Paul is making a strong case that this guy has, you know, straight up markers of poor prognosis, baseline erosions, and needs the heavy hitters. Who, who would not start methotrexate on this guy with, uh, with already uh, modestly elevated liver enzymes who, will, who is not really interested committing to decreasing his alcohol, which he's probably not telling you totally candidly about to begin with. Um, all right, so Michael, what's your, what's your gambit? Well, safety first. I mean, I, I don't know anything about this guy and, and, and what his compliance is gonna be and what his, alcohol tolerance is going to be, and uh, he's already got liver function abnormalities, I would be very concerned about just right away starting him on methotrexate. That's a really serious conversation uh, that goes down the line. This is a difficult case because, and I think Elaine was right to begin with, that you need to get his confidence first and make him feel better. Uh, before you approach many of these other issues. I, that's where I don't agree with your consultant here. I, I, don't, I wouldn't put, throw everything at this guy at once. I think he's going to get scared. So I would, I would back off a little bit and explain to him that we're limited by uh, his drinking and his liver function abnormalities, and we have to go down path B instead of path A. So, so a, a practical comment I would make is that by the time you... Uh, didn't give him methotrexate and appealed to insurance to, uh, to jump in with an anti-TNF as your first agent before um, giving any, any uh, DMARD, you're already uh, a, w a few weeks down the road and I would suggest to him that if we gave him a small dose of methotrexate, it's unlikely to stir up his liver in a, f in a few weeks to a month or two and use it as a bridge for insurance purposes. I'm just this isn't what I would do medically, but it's what I would do from a okay, practical Okay, so that's, a, you're, 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 you're addressing a system issue. Uh, yeah. In the absence of a system issue, if Paul, would you see any, any rationale to a monotherapy uh, uh, track in this guy? Oh, what if he was 64, 74, 84? Mono, like monotherapy, that. monotherapy biologic. Biologic. Bi biologic monotherapy. Yeah. Uh, if there were no cost issues, uh, probably, the, 
the, those liver function tests are, are extremely common at presentation, especially with a lot of disease activity. Frequently, they'll settle if you give them a dose of steroids, actually. Um, I know I've had a debate with Joel Kremer before now about methotrexate when I was accused of being in a country or a nation of alcoholics. <laughs> well, besides the fact that you are, but... That's... But it may be the truth. Um, but we don't, we don't actually get too worried about... Um, the incidence of cirrhosis is reduced in patients, rheumatoid patients on methotrexate. Uh, the epidemiological data that it's harmful to drink is very little in these patients. It's protective. It's one of the, the absolute protective uh, elements in getting rheumatoid. No one knows what it does when you've got it, but it it's actually so probably doesn't hurt you. In women. It's protective in women. It's protective in both now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in our pre-RA clinics. And it, it's what, yeah, outside smoking, it's the biggest environmental factor that we can influence. So uh, we would only actually be influenced by uh, methotrexate and mild. That's only, well, I don't know what the, the uh, units are there, but uh, uh, that doesn't look more than 100% to me. Tra trace of elevation. Yeah, and that is extraordinarily common. Uh, and, and also noting the fact that, you know, one set of uh, liver enzymes is not mm. definitive and uh, uh, Finding a pattern, um, most of these guys do reduce their drinking once they start methotrexate and they've read the patient information leaflet. So they, we, we don't actually have a big problem with stopping methotrexate in drinkers any more than we do in non-drinkers, to be honest. I mean, I, but the ambient level of alcohol and liver function abnormalities in the UK must be extraordinary so that this is more likely to be a false positive than a true positive, right? But. Well, we're not, he's not in the UK, so he's... <laughs> okay, well, we've solved this problem. So we have three microphones here. Anybody wants to get up and uh, have an extraordinarily strong opinion about this and uh, uh, parse with these guys, uh, please uh, come, come forward and uh, uh, state your mind, and uh, then we're going to go on to Len, the next there's case. A, there's a question over uh, there. Philip Syracuse. Yes, can hear you. Uh, so uh, uh, how about sulfasalazine? offer that along with the methotrexate to uh, our patient and uh, suggest that uh, uh, he cut down or stop his drinking. Well, you already answered that, Paul, didn't you, earlier? That so what do you think? Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's an option. Um, they, these guys, the, the likelihood of him requiring a biologic is high, and the trouble with self the reason we don't use salivazine in these sort of patients is because the combination with the TNF is not good in terms of induction of autoimmunity, et cetera. So it's what's killed sulfasalazine as a first-line drug. If you know you've got mild disease, definitely do it, yeah. But, but if in patients who have such a high likelihood of requiring a biologic, you have to consider where you are, and uh, same for lefronamide, except if you're using Rituxamide. One more, One more quick question, and then we've got to go to the second case. Sorry, it's just a statement. It's Francis Leon from Toronto. I work in a um, working class place. This guy is one of my patients. This guy needs to work tomorrow. He hasn't tomorrow. got time to fill around. I mean, like, this is rheumatoid arthritis. It's like a house on fire. You've got to put the fire, get the fire truck out, and the only yeah. thing that works quickly is Pregnancy. steroid. Yeah. So you've got to get him onto that steroid, get the thing under control, and then you fill around with getting the police out to get the fire to center. So that's your, your DMARTs, or if you get into the TNF or whatever you have. We come from a place where we, a lot of our patients do not have coverage either for medications, so we don't have that kind of options. So I would think that you know, this guy needs steroids so that he can keep going working, and then we'll work on the other things later. I appreciate that. Can I just make one comment? Yes. We, we did do a study, which was published last year, which compared IV steroid 250 milligrams versus IV infliximab. And amazingly, we got twice the remission rate with infliximab versus 250, completely against our hypothesis. So if you've got the availability of uh, TNF and our recent data, which showed that subcutaneous TNF produced 40% remission in date by week two, if you get very early induction, you, you know, they, they are as fast as steroids. So I, I completely agree with the sentiment, this guy's got to work, um, but how you, there are more than one ways of doing it. So I'm going to close this case, and I, I think that, that this is this is really uh, you guys have brought out every learning point that I tried to craft into this case. That this is not just a classic rheumatoid and classic rheumatoid with markers of poor prognosis, uh, but this is a man 
who has a uh, great uh, uh, desire to uh, maintain to be the breadwinner of his family. So we got to work around all of these obstacles of lifestyle, uh, disease, uh, drug drug interactions to do that. So before you move on, uh, would it be possible for you to just address the cardiovascular risk factors, please? I think there, there's a number of issues. You, you've talked about cigarette smoking. But there's, I think there's more to this than meets the eye. I'm going to, I'm going to take uh, the uh, uh, program chair discretion. You're absolutely, totally correct, uh, and there are robust cardiovascular issues in this guy, um, and uh, you know, as well as screening for other comorbidities and hepatitis and TB, et cetera. Uh, but we're going to have to move on to keep on our our agenda.